Hi, my name is Bill Robertson, and I've been here numerous times before talking about the books that I write. And lately I've been working on a series of books called the Ghost Revisited Books. And in the last couple of months, I was able to produce Ghost Revisited 5 and Ghost Revisited 6. And the way I was able to create these books so quickly is because I've just recently joined up with a paranormal group from OEN, New York. And they've taken me on some investigations and I learned a lot of, about a lot of other haunted places that I wouldn't have normally run across had I not joined up with these folks. And they're from Spirit Hunters Inc. is the name of their group. And to my immediate left is Lisa White Eagle and Shane White Eagle. And they're gonna today talk a little bit about how they started their group and the goals of their group and then show you some of the equipments that they use when they go on investigations. The reason I joined up with them is because they're actually very, very professional. And that really impressed me from the very beginning. Because I don't want to go around with a group of people who are, you know, going around conjuring up spirits here and there. I mean, they don't do that. They, you know, they're professional about the way that they conduct their investigation. And again, that made it appealing to me to join up with their group. So without further ado, I'll just turn over the program to them and they can talk a little bit about how they started their group, why they started it, and then talk about some of the equipment that they used. A couple years ago, two and a half years ago, something like that, maybe three, we decided we wanted to do something that was family oriented that we could take our children, because we have five grown children and a nine year old, and other relatives to do things that we could do as a family. We always had a fascination and a different understanding because of our native backgrounds of the paranormal. So uh, we gathered uh, and we decided to, you know, really make a run with this and start doing multiple locations. We're doing uh, 25 to 35 a year now. Um, our focus is on historic places and historic locations and we document all that. Uh, whether it for a client folder, but also on our media platforms. Um, we, then we look at those locations and then we go from there. We look at, yes, we, we have different platforms to try to, you know, to show what, you know, the history of this area to get more people involved. We are also working on the native side of things. We do uh, native research for like Lilydale. Um, Lillardale's another group that we are working with, Lillardale Hamlet, a lot of people are, are familiar with that, the spiritualist capital of the world. And we're the only group ever been allowed to actually investigate there. Um, also, we do, you know, we have been researching the native um, aspects of their land before they moved there. They thought they had something special spiritually, and it turns out it was. There's been uh, thousands of years of native occupant, uh, occ occ occupancy. <laughs> <laughs> occupation. I can't even talk. <laughs> and I don't normally do this, so I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> He's quite the talker, so. <laughs> um, anyway, there's been natives there for a long time. They use that property for spiritual uh, happenings. Uh, there's some earthen structures, structures there that are under the North Lake that have been there estimated some 10,000 years. Um, even all the way up to the Senecas when they moved north, they had a burial mound there. So they had uh, a lot of spiritual significance to that property before it became, you know, part of Lilladell, their camp, and then later a hamlet. So we do things like that also. Um, when we, as Native Americans, we grew up you know, that spirits are as normal and as common as you and I. They are real things that require respect, just like you would anyone else you were, you know, coming to meet. So we approach all our investigations in a respectful way. Um, we don't antagonize, you know, you see a lot of these shows where people are like, you know, dance for me, ghost. You know, we don't do that. We talk to people like people. And that's pretty much how we got started, and that's why we keep going, you know, forward. Um, Bill was a great addition to the group. We love incorporating um, historical societies. We have several partnerships. We also have a partnership with Kent County Economic uh, Department of Economic Development and Tourism. Um, we've done uh, 
county buildings. That's how we started with, with uh, Cat County is we looked at the stone house in Machias, New York. Um, that used to be a poorhouse for this county. A lot of horrible things unfortunately happened at poorhouses. Um, severe underfunding, um, you know, it led to many, many, many deaths and a lot of torment and horror for a lot of different people. And unfortunately, it wasn't just for people that, uh, you know, were poor. It ended up being single moms in a time period where that was, you know, not, you know, uh, accepted. Right. Uh, they had people with mental illness. And anybody that, you know, had a deformity. That was alcoholics. Considered. Yeah, alcoholics. Uh, deformities. Anybody who was embarrassed or had a, a person in their family that they didn't understand, unfortunately, a lot of times they ended up there. And a lot of times they're criminally insane. So you have a horrible different, you know, uh, lots of different groups of people that should never have been put together in one place to begin with. And then you, you combine that with a uh, lack of staff and a lack of funding, um, mental professionals, things like that. Um, so we went through a legislative vote to get into uh, the Stone House. And that was the beginning of our partnership with those people. Um, we also worked with, a, uh, had partnerships with a, a lot of historical societies like the Ellicottville Historical Society, Portville, um, and uh, a lot of individual historians that are, you know, from Wyoming County. Cindy Alhine is one of our people that works with us a lot. So we network to anyone and everyone that has any history, uh, that knowledge, and that uh, has experiences. And we share those things and we love the stories. Um, that's how we got started. What else do you? <laughs> yeah, what were some of the <coughs> scariest places that you visited during your investigations? Well, I'll at least start with that one. <laughs> um, well, I mean, if you ask different team members, they would give you different locations. But I don't know if it's not so much scary, but more active. And I think Shane would agree with that one that we call the Mimic House in Portville. Mimic House was, was creepy. That had a lot of activity in there from bangs to things that sound like they were just crashing and footsteps and our um, tools here were going off like crazy. Some were just being drained. Um, we call it the Mimic House because whatever entity was in the basement would mimic our team members' voices. So one team member would be upstairs thinking, you know, they're being called, but there was nobody they could explain who it was. Right. You know, so, I mean, even me, they thought I was talking, but I was outside. Yeah. And I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> it, it, which is very unusual. Most earthbound spirits um, do not have that ability. Now, when we're looking at these investigations, it's not just people that have passed away that we may be dealing with. There could be all kinds of different types of spiritual beings. Um, in this case, it could mimic voices from family members that weren't even there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, we were reviewing video, and you could clearly hear my second youngest daughter say, oh, I, I'm so happy. And I just said, well, I'm glad she had fun there. And a couple other people said the same thing. And then my youngest son says, she wasn't at that investigation. <laughs> um, we have Monkey, which is actually Justin, but we call him Monkey, and his wife, Tana. The mimic, mimic them a lot. Um, and they got scared. Uh, Lisa and I are a little harder to, to get under our skins, but with those two, it was, you know, very uncomfortable. And in, in addition, it would touch them. Um, it's touched actually all the women in our, our group <laughs> inappropriately. It's something it touched Lisa on the on the rear and it touched uh, Chrissy and it touched everybody and a couple of the guys too inappropriately, um, which is an unpleasant feeling when you're you know when you can't see what's coming. <laughs> uh, keep in mind too, we're in jet black darkness. Um, that house was a surprise. Um, it could also interact with our equipment 
and answer questions. Like if we had the spirit ball, you could say, uh, if you're here, make the spirit ball move and it will move and start flashing. Spirit. Um, we, we could use, you know, other equipment like the footstep tracker, things like that, or ram pods that could, it could control the electromagnetic field of and respond. You know, you could say, well, make the rim pod uh, blink twice, go off twice for a yes answer, you know, no, you know. Um, that was one of the ones too. I think a lot of our crew members realized that, you know, spirits can lie too. <laughs> the thing I was really impressed with about spirit hunters is they have all the latest equipment that they use in their paranormal investigations and I'd like them next to talk a little bit about some of the different uh, equipment that they use. And one of one of the pieces of equipment's going off right now. So there's something active in this building as well. Um, the, there's, we have multiple types of uh, electric magnetic meters, right? They meet, uh, read uh, magnetic fields and or energy fields, okay? Um, and some are a little more sensitive than the others. Some of them also show a temperature. So if a temperature uh, spikes in a room more than 10 degrees or five, you can see it immediately. Uh, and that is a way in the, a number of our investigations we could communicate with a spirit. Uh, we just had a little break and this rim pod here went off. We were talking about, you know, because a lot of times when you speak about spirits, uh, if something's around, then it tries to communicate. As we responded to it, then it started going beep, 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 beep. And then this K2 meter, which you use in construction just to find an electrical line in a wall, right? That's what all these mail meters originally were used for. Um, I used to have a construction company. We used to use them on a, on a regular basis. But, you know, it, there are excellent tools. Uh, sometimes in investigations, too, it will determine or let us see if there's somebody has an electrical issue. We did um, the Enchanted Valley Inn in Portville. Uh, they have a lot of activity there. A beautiful little inn, but they had uh, 430 milligauss magnetic fields in that house because the wiring was done in, uh, was improper. Uh, somehow the outside main line got mixed up with the uh, with the internal line and caused it to go crazy, which makes people sick. It can cause all kinds of other problems. But anyway, we use these different types of equipment to determine what might be there. Um, Lacey, would you like to explain a couple? Or? Yeah, don't you like to use the dowsing rods? Maybe you could start with that. I do. Um, and at first I was a little skeptic because I was just like, well, you know, they're just, you know, they're the copper, you know, what are they going to do? But then the more I used them and came attuned to them, they are really a good, a good source that I think I, I like to use a lot of the times. Um, How do they work? They work by, okay, so <laughs> usually if I hold them before an investigation, I'll say, show me yes, and their yes to, is points to me. And if I say, uh, show me no, they cross. So mostly if I ask like an open-ended question, you know, I get yes or no. Um, or I can get dates. If I just go like, I don't know, yeah. by years, you know, is it like 1988, the no, is 1989, no, and then, you know, they'll say yes or no. Um, I can get names, same thing, same concept, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, they'll cross, and then just kind of go from there. So like this one here is going off, and this, your mom likes to use this one a lot, uh, this one here. Um, and like Shane said, there's like, you know, usually electrical, but there's nothing over here that's electrical. So there's no reason why it should be going off. Right, and it was completely flatlined. If there's an electrical component into the floor or something like that, it would make, do a steady reading. Um, but this is, these are energy spikes. Uh, that is a good indicator that something is there. Mm -hmm. Another thing she does with these rocks is she can, it will point out where spirits or things are. She's found a number of stuff, things that were lost or hidden or secret with those rides. Um, and of course, we don't say that that's proof of paranormal, but what we do then is investigate. Uh, we were at 
um, the Genesee Falls Inn. And it's a, also a nice little old uh, historic inn. Um, recently, some, I think it was 2016, they lost one of their caretakers. When we were there, we were getting, and I didn't know the whole story. I tried not to get all the paranormal stories beforehand because I don't want to be influenced. I just look, focus on the history, right? Um, some of it, in some places like that, are the, you know, the, everything's so known and open. I thought I understood that the man passed away in room 26, didn't know his name at the time, um, but I was wrong. Lisa was in the, there with the rods. She's getting all this while well, he, yes, he passed away in the, but he passed away in the hotel, not actually in the outer apartment of the, the facility. And the, he, he told us that he was in a fight, um, that he sustained a lot of injuries and did not go to the hospital and eventually succumbed to his injuries. I didn't know and anything. Right down to the room number. Right. Oh, Lewis. and the date. It spelled out with you do it one letter, letter at a time, Lewis. It turns out Lewis. the guy's name, they call him Lou, but it was Lewis. Um, and we talked to a couple of friends of his. We also talked to the historian over there. And he indeed was in a fight um, and sustained severe injuries. And he was an older man. Um, but according to what we were told is he died of a cardiac event, which just means the heart stopped, right? But he never went to the hospital, even when he passed away. So there was a lot of controversy there. Um, but her rides, I mean, what I thought I knew, it, you know, she was right on with it. And we've had that happen on several investigations. To the point where the people were like, how did you know that? Right, <laughs> and, and, and you know, and, Hope, you know, property owners will have their own secrets, you know, and unfortunately in this case, you know, it, it nailed it. I had her and her husband, and uh, they were from Long Island, and her sister on the phone, and they had to admit, it, it was funny because when the husband told me about the fight, the wife didn't even know. So, you know, this, these rods really picked that out. Um, we have several instruments. These are rim pods, like I said, they can determine uh, temperature changes more than five degrees and it will show in a different light set and a different sound if there's a, a, a dramatic change in temperature and it'll also show uh, magnetic and energetic uh, energy spikes um, that one is a lot more sensitive costs a lot more um, but we, we have a, a different bunch of different types of motion sensors like this one we have laser grids which will uh, put a constant beam of light all over a room that are constant and steady, right? So in, you know, in a couple cases, you can see like if something, a dark mass is forming. Uh, one situation actually at the Mimic House, you see this dark form start to appear right in front of the, this and it, it cuts off the laser or makes the laser brighter because it's reflecting off of it. And you see the, the dark mass go in front of the camera and then disappears. Um, this is a footstep tracker. Uh, literally, it will track footsteps. Um, it also has a little chip in there. All, almost all these things are, have chips and microchips that we get that information from. Um, it will log every event that happens. Bill had some experience with this one. Yes, I did. Over at the World War II Museum in Eldred, uh, another lady who's part of their group, uh, uh, Chrissy Holt. Yeah, Chrissy Holt. She and I were in the room with that footstep tracker and started a conversation up with the actual person who was from Eldred, who was killed in World War II. And when his son donated his uh, medals to the museum, he attached himself to those medals. So he was there in the museum. And we learned his identity. We found out, you know, again, that he was born in Eldred. And also we found out, you know, what his job was in the Navy and all kinds of information about him. And then I left and then she carried on another like 45 minute conversation with him later on and learned a lot more. And then we told the, the curator over there what we had, had learned. And he said, well, yeah, that's such and such. And he even brought out the guy's file so we could read his file and everything that she learned about him was actually in the file. So that was really, that, that really put me right out. 
at that thing, even though it was uh, wood on concrete floor, it was going off almost all night. Yeah, all night long. Uh, it was crazy. Um, this is a spirit music box. And uh, I think it looks like a cool little coffin toy, um, but it's a $500 piece of equipment. <laughs> it actually sends out a sonic pulses, right? Yeah, you can turn it on. Um, it will scan the environment and then if anything interrupts those pulses like that, it will go off. The closer that I or whatever is to the box, the faster the music plays. The farther away, uh, it slows down. Um, this footstep tracker here, it's not really a footstep tracker. That also sends out pulses. So if something walks down a hall, you can put this down a hall, it will track with LED lights where this thing is walking, right? All the way down. So you got, you know, a, a six foot or seven foot area that you can track something moving. Um, you want to talk about the Envoy? And... Um, I'm not sure what it was. But this one, you was talking about grids. Similar to this one here, this one also is a grid. It shoots out red grids, but this one also has um, like an LED screen. So if something were to walk in front of it, it also will pop up on here. Like the, the blocks would block out to where they are and it'll tell you what distance they're coming from or which side they're coming from. And yeah. so, yeah, they're pretty, pretty advanced. That laser grid, uh, that's a laser grid tracker. That also has a scanner. There's a little plastic thing that's covering it up right now that also sends out pulses too. So anything that interrupts the grid in a register, anything that, uh, you know, has a pulse to it, you know, something that stops a pulse, I should say, almost like a bat with an echo, uh, it'll read that also. The, it has uh, like a 20 foot circumference. So anything that walks by, you can see where it is and it'll show up on the screen. For closer stuff, it will actually show a 3D image. Like if you put your hand closer, mm -hmm. it'll show the shape of your hand. Um, so it's a really cool tool. Uh, the bottom bar, if something is actually touching the instrument itself, will go off. Um, the Envoy, that's kind of a cool thing. Yeah, it's kind of like the magic eight ball. <laughs> <laughs> so, cause there's like different, um, there's like different things. You can ask yes or no answers and they'll, you have to actually tap it to get like a yes or no answer. Like it flashes yes or no. And like, if you were to ask a question, I don't know, just. Is there a spirit I, here now? Yeah, so it flashes and it it, it says yes. So um, and it tells you whether they tapped it or what, so. Right, and there's three ways for it to set that off. Yeah. Whether physical touch, a temperature spike five degrees up or down or an electronic magnetic response so the, and it'll tell you how it was responded to on, on the screen mm -hmm. yeah you can do the yes and no you can do like it'll circulate through the abcs and the same concept they'll have to stop it at a certain letter and they just they tap it and then you know and it's, it has also too like it has like faces on it, like your smiley face, sad face, stuff like that. Emotions. So if, if, if a spirit wants to show an emotion, it's a way it can focus on that sad face, say, and show us how it's feeling without having to try to spell that out. Um, it's really a cool tool, uh, a really cool scientific tool. Um, the next one is a combination of Mel meter and REM pod. It will also, tell you the temperature. Uh, it will read electric magnetic forces, but anything that touches it or comes within that magnetic field, they, uh, goes around it, it'll set it off too. And then Which came to... in handy also at the museum. Yeah, the, the museum, museum, by the way, <laughs> is a beautiful place with lots of great history there. I would recommend everybody go, but it also has a lot of spiritual activity. There's a um, a lot of sadness and there's a lot of these lot of different things happening there it the was, thing that uh, was really the scariest part for me was the owner of the museum the one who established it 
got donated all these uniforms by you know people's relatives and he didn't set them out right away he didn't display all the uniforms so all of a sudden he started getting haunted by the men who wore the uniforms until they got all the jackets clean and put out and now he has them all on display up in the library and that's the place that has the most activity mm -hmm. that's so can you imagine that if you're the owner of the place and all of a sudden the spirits start the ghosts start coming and haunting you saying you must put out my jacket <laughs> and he did <laughs> well and we should note too he was not a believer in the paranormal grouchy or older guy and he he didn't believe in anything like that yeah but he, he called uh, steve appleby the uh, curator and said you got to get these out right now and steve's like well we don't have that much space you know we have to circulate these and he said nope they're coming after me you know he get them out there. that's what he actually said the ghosts are coming <laughs> after me you have to put these uniforms out now yeah and he did he did <laughs> yeah. um you want to explain about the spirit box there um, this is what they call the spirit box. It, when you turn it on, it cycles through AM and FM radio stations. Um, in the, what we do with this is we put on like noise canceling headphones as this is going through because they say that white noise is also a way that spirits like to communicate. So we put on the headphones. A lot of the times we'll put on blindfolds so we can't see or here, except for what's coming through here. And the other teammates will ask questions. And the point is to get the spirits to go through the white noise. And you'll pick up their answers of what they're talking, and then you repeat what they say. Right. So, so they're, yeah, they're blindfolded and have earmuffs, so they can't see or hear what you're asking. So you're asking, it's called the Estes method. Um, it should, and you can change the speeds on it, but it will shuffle through these really fast, these stations. So if you get words that go over three or four stations at once, you know it's not a radio signal. The idea is that, that spirits are a, an energy form, right? And almost anything electronic, even for older spirits, there are, especially younger ones, we found that with people that have passed away within the last 20, 30 years seem to be able to you know, manipulate these things better but even cell phones, computers, if you have something and you're talking to spirits and it can control the energy, it can, it can use those to communicate. So we use our cell phones, they're a great tool. I mean, the best tools are personal selves or bodies. You gotta trust your instincts and what you're feeling um, and you gotta know your limits. Um, but uh, that spirit box, I mean, we've got some crazy stuff out of there, you know, and. It's, on, it's, on my first investigation that I went on with these guys, we went up to the Anthonian Hall up in Lewis Run, and now it's Protocol 80. It's an inbound uh, marketing place, and Chrissy Holtz works there, was part of the team, and she got permission from her boss for us to go in and do an investigation. It was the first time I'd ever been on an investigation. We went in this one room and we were using the spirit box and Chrissy was the one with the blindfold on and the, the headphones and she was communicating with this little girl named Rachel. And we'd ask her all these questions and Rachel would answer them. And we had like a half hour conversation with her and then she kept asking, can you see me, can you see me? But she didn't have enough energy to manifest her, her spirit. So we couldn't see her, but that was her main concern. Can you see me, can you see me? And then later on, she ended up in another room playing with a spirit ball, and she would bat it across the table and it would light up, and you know she was having fun with that. And then she answered more questions down there. So to me, that freaked me out. I was actually talking to a dead girl. You know what I mean? <laughs> Holy cow! Yeah, when you put it, as you can see that spirit ball. You put it down, it sits. So when it starts to move around the table, you know, for an extended period of time, especially something's going on, especially if there's not, you know, everybody's in a seated position. Um, and she, if I remember correctly, was also using other devices to communicate at the yeah. same time. Yeah, you was. know, she liked the rib pod, she liked the spirit ball, she liked the, a few other things. She was even, there was one story and there was something was, you could hear it, the computer kept coming on even though there was in the keyboard. The keyboard was taken on by the owner, but you could hear tapping, like the keys going off, and then the, the monitor would come on. Now we asked if this was a, thing, like a screensaver type of thing, but it wasn't. 
Um, so we always try to make sure we validate everything. We don't just assume everything's paranormal. And, uh, we were talking about the spirit box. The Estes method is a valuable way to be able to communicate with spirits. And uh, I, one of my first times I was ever touched, and I, I'll admit too, I've only had two times when I've been on that, and I've been on it, you know, I don't know, 12, 15 times, that I had any experiences with it. Right, and the one time it was talking my ear off, and I was feeling bad because it was a woman saying, "Help me, please," and this really negative, nasty mouth guy responding to her, telling her to shut up, things like that. So it was, it made me very uncomfortable. And then I felt something grab my hand and pull it. I took my stuff stuff off, thinking a glance or somebody was saying, "Hey, you know, this is you know, let's do something else," um, but no. Agreeing with you. We should uh, we should note too that this almost this entire uh, interview or this discussion, this K two meter has been going off, um, which is kind of a cool thing. Something is is uh, enjoying our conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Shane's son Hunter's had a lot of experiences. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about some of the things that he's experienced. Uh, apparently, every house that these folks have lived in has been haunted. <laughs> and he's really susceptible to that energy, so maybe we'd like to talk uh, well, about Well, yeah. Uh, we we uh, should note, too, that some people are more sensitive than others. Uh, once you have the knowledge that there may be things that, once you open your mind to that possibility, I notice, too, that people are, are a lot more, uh, have a lot more experiences. Um, sometimes it's forced on them. But, uh, in my son's case, he was always a little sensitive. He does get a lot of interaction when we're on investigation still today. Um, but he's had, at one point, when we, we have five grown children and a nine-year-old. We used to invite a lot of kids that are over the house. Sometimes people do things that they're not supposed to. We had this, something come up into our second floor house and our dog who used to sleep in front of the door would refuse to go upstairs after that for a number of months. We kept smoking our house, which is the way to cleanse it, um, and doing other things that we, you know, in our religious beliefs, but nothing was helping. Hunter had something that held him down to his, in his bed a couple times uh, that terrified him. He was about 16, 15 or something like that. Something kept yanking his blanket off all the way to the other side of the room and then would pleat at the bottom of the wall. Um, on for months, his bed, every time we would leave the house, would get pulled out from the wall. Uh, the last time that happened, the entire bed was not only pulled out, but was, and bed frame was lifted up and laying against the wall. Um, he would have his light go on and off, on and off, on and off. And you could, it's not just the light bulb, the, the switch was a, a stiff switch, really loud click up and down. Um, he had a little latch on his door. Uh, he was getting a dress one time and that latch popped off. Um, he put it back on, it popped off again, he put it back on. <laughs> so eventually we found out that somebody had been doing a Ouija board in our house in the attic and um, invited something in our hall. And because it wasn't closed properly, that's why we couldn't get rid of it in the, the regular way. Once we did, dog was up the stairs again, everything was back to normal in the house. But um, Hunter's always been able to see, you know, sense things a lot more than a lot of people, um, even when he was uh, in the Army and uh, since he's been back in the Army. Um, he's been pretty sensitive. Uh, the women, most of our women in our group are a lot more sensitive. Um, Bill seems to be attract things. Um, to some degree, <laughs> but I, and because he's still kind of new to the group, sometimes I don't say it to him because I didn't want to, to freak him out, but I've seen things and I've measured things that were close to him without him realizing it. Thank um, goodness. <laughs> because I, you know, bless. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we've had a lot of fascinating locations. We actually had another 15 coming up in the next several weeks. Um, we're doing Wilmot Estates this weekend. And the weekend after that, we're doing the Smith Parish Hardware Store, which was all, uh, right across from the, the uh, Portable Library, which used to be the Smith Parish Mansion. 
Um, we're doing the William E. Wheeler house. There we go, right there. Maybe that's what the connection is. Um, that is a rim pod, and that only happens if something breaks that field. So keep that in mind. <laughs> oh, and they just went <laughs> like it was saying yes. <laughs> we also found that when stuff starts to happen like that and they're getting attention, it does feed them in some way. And a lot of times that happens more often. Um, she's going to do a reading to see if she can get some kind of feel for that but yeah we've had some great places and we love working with people and, and getting the history uh, we look forward to our, our symbiotic uh, relationship with Bill the 37. future 37.1 it popped up to so there's fluctuation in there so 6.7 yeah there's, there's something there's something there we're getting a very real reading here that's that's kind of cool um, and this is a newer building from what I understand uh, there's some misconception just because the building is new doesn't mean it doesn't have activity uh, something could be attached to the land or something could be brought in there's a lot of trigger you know items that could be all through this library right um, so so we're getting some pretty cool readings right now yeah just a little bit ago that monitor the with camera. the stick yeah. yeah. Um, change color and lit up. And that was a couple minutes ago. Oh, yeah, it's, I didn't even it's keeping it. it's keeping track. This is there's 44 events right there. Yeah, but keep in mind <laughs> some of that is when we hit our hands on the table and stuff. But if our hands are all still, still as it happens, then it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, anything else, uh, Bill, that we want? To yeah, if you want to look, have a more intimate view of the group and also of Hunter's experiences, I've written about them and those who visited six. And I have a, a really nice profile about spirit hunters, and then also, he um, yeah, and even the ghost <laughs> likes it. And then, like you say, there's a profile about Hunter too, and all the things that he has experienced during his life, actually. And, it, and again, if I hadn't have hooked up with these guys, I wouldn't have been able to finish this book. I'd still be working on it because they've given me so many great uh, places to go, and I learned so much from them. That was the reason, and again, I wanted to learn more because, you know, I was ignorant too. I mean, even though I do the history on these places, I didn't know anything about the spirits themselves or how to locate them or anything like that. And using this equipment and hanging out with these guys has been a real eye-opener for me, and I appreciate you letting me in your group. Oh, absolutely. Um, we found a lot of our, we have our core group, um, but we also invite a lot of other people's depending you know a lot a lot of our property owners we we you know, learn them we get to know them uh we understand that they're not looking out at, to do something negative and uh you know like joanne mansfield with uh, lilydale she's going to be coming to several of these places with us um one of our our part-time members um trish johnson owns the rimwick house in uh Delma? belfast uh, belfast belfast Oh, there's a picture of it right there on the cover of my book. Right there on the book. <laughs> um, she goes to a, a lot of investigations with us. So we we share the wealth out there. And we encourage anyone that wants to know or learn or share stories to contact us. We have several media platforms, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, two accounts. We have a website. We, Lisa has a blog called uh, ghostlychronicles.com. Tell you some of her crazy stories from growing up. Um, <laughs> It started on the reservation in uh, Six Nations, or close to there. Um, so you'll you'll find out a lot about us and, uh, you know, join our groups and we'll be able to show you a lot of the same things we get. We also do a podcast. We try to do it weekly, but we're so busy during this time of year that it's almost impossible. Um, and we will link, you know, Bill's stuff and these shows. If we can get this one, we can do that too. Um, and share that information with us. We will document everything that we hear if you want it to be documented. And we keep it private if you want it private. But uh, we like to share that info and that history. They agree. Right. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for having us on. And we appreciate you uh, having us here at the Bradford Public Library. And hopefully we could come back another time. <laughs>